Hello, I'm Larry Good with City TV. Welcome to this edition of Inside Santa Barbara, the city's only news magazine program. We keep you up to date on the city's most significant projects, issues, and events. Just imagine you're still driving a car from the 1960s or relying on a household appliance from the same era. Sounds like a lot of tweaking and jerry-rigging just to keep things operational. Well, that's exactly what the Santa Barbara Police Department has been doing for decades with its police station. But now, at long last, there's a plan to move the entire police force into something 21st century. Built in 1959 to house a staff and sworn personnel at the time of 85, the Santa Barbara Police Station today is home to more than double that number at 211. It's not efficient. We have a lot of people crammed into small spaces, so it definitely isn't ideal by any means. The building's deficiencies run on and on and on, from outdated electrical infrastructure and limited storage area to crawl spaces filled with asbestos and lead paint. It's nostalgic, it's historical, absolutely, but it doesn't function for the current public safety needs of the city of Santa Barbara. This cement structure is unreinforced and too expensive to bring up to today's earthquake codes. Plus, the building is too small and makes no economic sense to retrofit. Seismically, it is not uh, up to today's code. It was built in 1959, and clearly my, my job is to get them out of that building as soon as possible. Brad Hess is the City of Santa Barbara's project manager in its effort to move out of the old station and into something larger, more efficient, and built for policing in the year 2020. The operations and the efficiencies of going that go on between the parking structure and the building actually facilitate um, what they do every day. Hess says officers still do a remarkable job despite the deficiencies. And as you can see, everything's a maze around here. Before we show you the future, here's the present. Um, and then that's our holding cell area, our interview rooms, and then a witness interview room. Again, everything very compact. Captain Arroyo led us through every nook and cranny, including this room where the officers keep their gear. Every retrofitted closet, like the one that's used as the female officer's locker room. And pointed out technology shortcomings, which can mean a blown circuit or a communication breakdown at any time. The police station layout in many cases is not logically based, so operations and equipment go where things fit. So when they arrest somebody, they have to bring them on the other side of the building, but then they have to bring them through various different hallways and doors to get a photograph of them. Then they have to take them back through various different hallways and doors to get them secure again, which is separate from where they write the reports, which is separate from where they keep their equipment, which is separate from where we park all the uh, police vehicles, which is over on the other side of the building. You get the point. The police department right now operates in four separate buildings because this isn't large enough for us. So what that does is it impacts the community directly. If the public comes to the counter for recovered property, they typically have to wait for it to be retrieved off-site. And the police department's public meeting room cannot handle large community-wide gatherings. The elevator doesn't come to the third floor and there's no way to get somebody in a wheelchair up to the third floor. The parking around the police department is always an extreme challenge. Many staff and police officers have to park blocks away, taking up spaces in residential neighborhoods. And whatever can't fit into the property room gets shoved into available closet space. A new building is being something that is truly a part of the community and will be better utilized and more accessible by the public as a whole. The Santa Barbara voting public as a whole said enough is enough in 2017. Citizens approved Measure C, a one cent sales tax increase for infrastructure improvements like a new police station. Measure C generates over $20 million a year. This is actually ideal. He's pointing to the city parking lot at Coda and Santa Barbara streets. City leaders narrowed the choices for a new police station to two the Coda Street lot, and the Louise Lowry Davis Center at Victoria and De La Vina Streets. The Louise Lowry location has more space, but to maximize its use, some historical buildings would need to be moved, and lawn bowling patrons would lose their longtime playground. And finally, to change its use from a city park to something else would also take a public vote, with no guarantee the public would approve the change. So we could be right back where we started come uh, November of this year, and that's just a delay we weren't prepared to, to take on. So the Coda parking lot is currently the front runner. 
you start at the, with just a bare ground site and you're able to design exactly the way you want to to accommodate all the needs and create a really efficient system. This is a preliminary computer rendering of a modern, efficient, and flexible police station at the Coda Street parking lot. The design is 72,000 square feet consisting of three floors above ground and a basement level. Uh, the new building is going to be you know, much taller ceilings, have a, a structural grid that facilitates movement within the building as needs in, in the program change. And the neighboring 250 space parking structure works in concert with the new police station. There will be a floor to floor relationship between the police station and the parking structure to create a more efficient day to day operation for both police personnel and the public. Right now, the police force is, is bifurcated through the community, and this is going to bring them all together into one place. The Coda lot is at its minimal standard going to be 30,000 square feet more than we have right now um, with all the four spaces that we occupy. So to me, that's what's essential. We're going to have the space to operate. This will be an incredibly efficient system operationally. Uh, obviously, seismically, it's not going to be an issue. We will design it to, to the standards. Um, but really, what they're going to find is that the way that they operate, the way that they do business on a day-to-day -day basis, is just, just going to be dramatically improved. There is an option, too, at the Coda Street lot, which would include access next door to a portion of the parking lot owned by the state employment office. If a rental or purchase agreement can be reached, it would provide for additional public parking and better police employee access to the new building. However, the project can still go forward without the use of the EDD parking lot. Either way, Kernal is convinced that Santa Barbara residents will profit dramatically from a new police station. The building is going to be an opportunity to enhance the connection between the public and the police department. There's going to be a meeting room that will serve multi-uses. Um, there's going to be a lot more of a, a physical presence, I think, that will serve the community as a whole. For more than three decades, the Coda Street parking lot has been the home of the Saturday Farmers Market. The City of Santa Barbara and the Farmers Market Association are working on an alternative site. The city has offered De La Guerra Plaza as a relocation option. The plaza would be redesigned as a level uniform surface, and one block of De La Guerra Street would be made available between State and Anacapa Streets as well. So every Saturday, there would be an energy in the plaza that there is not today. Everyone is very excited about it. There's a lot of momentum behind it. Uh, it really can change the face of that portion of, of Santa Barbara because right now it's not used other than old Spanish days once a year. The rest of the time it pretty much lays dormant and we want to change that. If De La Guerra Plaza is the preferred option, the farmer's market relocation would be in late 2020 or early 2021, which means the police station on the Coda Street parking lot would be finished in 2023 or 2024. It's incredibly exciting to solve the police department's functional problems that, that are, you know, immense right now and to give them a home that's going to last them for a very long time. And now with Measure C and the public support that we are on the path and we are close to finding a location and it's moving on. So to be able to plan for something state-of-the-art and know it's coming is something really exciting and rewarding. Before any designs or decisions are made, the public will have multiple opportunities for public input, and your ideas are welcome. If you'd like to get involved, just go to santabarbaraca.gov slash police station. Up next, we learn how the police department is using technology to allow the public to report crime more efficiently. Kalisha Abad has that story. The Santa Barbara Police Department launched a new online reporting system where citizens can file a non-emergency report, such as an anonymous tip, identity theft, or vandalism. Citizens still have the option to call the non-emergency number or file their report in person. The online system offers a bilingual option for Spanish speakers to make filing a report quick and easy. You should receive an online notification immediately that your report has been submitted 
Our records department will take a look at that online report, most likely assign it to the right uh, bureau, uh, and an officer will respond if needed. The way the cop logic works is um, we don't necessarily get an email to notify us when a report comes in. Um, we check it throughout the day. So usually what we do is if we have a, a new report that comes in, um, we check the incident type. We go ahead and review what the person um, reports. And depending on the circumstances, if they do have suspect information, we um, refer them to come in person to file it as opposed to online. Um, we also check the severity of the incident that they're reporting and that also determines whether they need to speak to an officer as opposed to filing a report online. Um, once we go ahead and review their information, we also make sure that every incident um, has the requirements for it. So if it's like an unlocked vehicle theft and their narrative states that it was actually locked, that actually will become a report they would have to file in person as opposed to online. We also check to see if there's like forced entry, anything like that. Um, after we review it and we deemed it as appropriate for online reporting, we go ahead and approve it and we route it to the investigative bureau and that's when they follow up with the victim. The online reporting system allows the police department to prioritize reports based on their severity. It also helps the record bureau direct each report to the correct department. The online system significantly reduces the amount of labor hours required to respond to reports. I think the community will enjoy uh, that the interface is quite easy to understand and use. Uh, you even have the capability of attaching documents and it makes it uh, quick uh, to be able to have a report in hand uh, to be able to hand off to an insurance company. This has significantly reduced the cost of paper for the police department as well as uh, created some efficiencies in processing reports. So for example, prior to online reporting, a uh, citizen would have to come into the police department, explain what their situation involved, uh, what type of report they were going to file, and then they would be provided a uh, hard copy report form to complete it while in the lobby. Or they would uh, contact um, dispatch either through 911 or the non-emergency number to have an officer sent to their home to take a police report. Once we offered online reporting, uh, the majority of the crimes that the uh, police department records bureau would process by way of the public coming into the lobby was significantly reduced. The online reporting system is not a substitute uh, for an emergency call. Uh, when you feel threatened or when you feel unsafe, it's important that you know that the 911 system is still available for you to make that call. To use the online reporting system, just visit santabarbaraca.gov slash report crime. In 1912, it was an engineering marvel, and more than 105 years later, it still plays a crucial role in our water supply. Up next, we follow city staff as they inspect the Mission Tunnel. When the city of Santa Barbara was first incorporated, the population was sparse, and groundwater combined with creek water coming through the old Mission Aqueduct was enough to sustain the city. But as the population grew and drought cycles occurred, the city began a search for additional supply. Looking north, um, they identified the San Inez River as a potential source of water. But in 1904, they let a contract. I think it ended up being almost $600,000. Uh, back in 1904, it was big money. And two contractors, start, one started on the uh, northern side of the San Inez and one started on the southern side and they began construction of the tunnel and it took better part of six years. I think they finished in 1910 and the tunnel ended up being about 3.7 miles long. An interesting historical fact is actually Mission Tunnel was built before Gibraltar um, and the whole idea is if we can't get a tunnel through there having a dam doesn't do us any good. So once Mission Tunnel was completed in 1910 a contract was released for Gibraltar to be built in 1913 and that took about seven years to build Gibraltar before that whole thing could work as uh, one system. More than a century after its completion, Mission Tunnel continues to play a critical role in Santa Barbara's water supply. It's one of two that it allows us to move water from uh, north of the San Inez Mountains and uh, it's, it's still to this day an important 
part of, of delivering. I mean, if we were to lose Tekalodi Tunnel, which is the other tunnel that comes from Kachuma, um, it would be vital to helping us to meet the health and safety needs of our community. Playing such an important role in the supply of such a vital resource, Mission Tunnel is inspected yearly. What we do is we take a crew of between three and six individuals. We uh, walk through the, the tunnel. There's uh, specific points where we actually take measurements of the um, width of the tunnel. We also take observations of, of the condition of the tunnel. It's a, a challenging environment because when you go through that tunnel, you're walking in water the entire time. And that water depth varies from waist deep to you know, ankle deep. The bottom is uneven. It's you know, kind of difficult at times. There's rocks you can't see under the water as you're kind of walking along. It's actually interesting. So we start off uh, with, a, with a very formed um, uh, architectural arch um, that supports the tunnel. And then we start breaking into pieces where it's just natural cave uh, and opening uh, where the, the natural rock was strong enough to support the tunnel. And so they left it that way. And, and it's very interesting because the, the groundwater intrusion uh, has caused stalactites to form uh, fairly rapidly. The water that infiltrates into the tunnel and creates those stalactites is not only interesting, it's substantial. We get probably about 500 uh, gallons per minute of groundwater uh, that continuously flows into the tunnel and is continuously fed down to Laurel Reservoir. Uh, um, and it can increase up to about uh, one, uh, one million gallons per day, uh, depending on if we have heavy rains or not. I like to tell people it's like a horizontal well, instead of going straight down into the ground like um, typical groundwater. This one goes through the mountain and basically water that's trickling down through cracks in the rock uh, will find, them, find their way into the tunnel. The geology of the San Inez Mountains that the tunnel goes through has many faults and fissures, which can cause problems when there's movement. So that's a vulnerability to the tunnel that we've had over the years. We've had a few collapses. I think the last one we had was in 92, 93, we had a collapse in the tunnel and we spent about a million dollars repairing that particular section. So that's the, the, the area of most concern uh, that we monitor and we're continuously monitoring to make sure those repairs are holding, and they are. The recent inspection of Mission Tunnel found no significant issues, adding another year to an incredibly long period of successful operation of this historic piece of infrastructure. It's a three mile, you know, a, a very unique three mile hike. Uh, and I, I do enjoy kind of going through and reminding myself of the history, uh, how it got put together and, and you know, what we see there ge geologically and, um, and what it does, really. You know, making sure that we can convey that water from uh, the San Inez River. It's really a remarkable, you know, um, piece of ingenuity in that sense and, and something that, yes, I, I, couldn't, I can only imagine the arguments over spending $600,000 on a tunnel in, in the early 1900s, but it certainly has been something that is pay dividends to this community for years and years and years, and I think to go into the future as well. If you'd like to learn more about the city's water supply, just visit santabarbaraca.gov slash water. We'll be right back with more Inside Santa Barbara right after this. I grew up here, I've made memories here, and I love being able to drive around knowing that this is my community, I'm helping my community. I truly believe that you can change people's lives on this job, and, and for the better. This career is for someone who wants to be challenged deep down inside to better a community. It's the best job in the world, it really is. It's like a dream come true. Join your home team. Hug the coast on your way to work. Early morning train service starts April 2nd from Ventura County to Santa Barbara and Goleta. Arrive at work refreshed and ready for the day. Enjoy a hot coffee. Stay relaxed. Free Wi-Fi sound good? It's time to experience a better way to travel. Go to PacificSurfLiner.com or contact a traffic solution specialist to book your tickets and find out more. Welcome back. There's an upcoming project at Garden and Antipamu Streets that will improve access for all pedestrians and get drivers through the intersection faster than ever. For the first time in Santa Barbara history, the city is taking down traffic signals at an intersection and replacing them with four-way stop signs. Sometime this fall, city transportation crews will begin construction work at Garden and Anapamu Streets. 
They will be repairing sidewalks and replacing two pedestrian access ramps that do not meet today's federal standards for the Americans with Disabilities Act. However, underneath those access ramps is traffic signal wiring that will have to be relocated at a cost of $50,000 if the signals are to keep operating. And because of that, the traffic signal wiring and underground conduit needs to be relocated. Uh, that's a really expensive uh, endeavor. Uh, so we use that opportunity to reevaluate the intersection as a whole. City transportation engineers studied and concluded that in the case of Garden and Annapamu, the intersection does not need traffic lights. There's a really short rush in the morning of about 15 minutes long with uh, school-related traffic for Santa Barbara High School, which is just down the street. And again in the evening, there's about a 15-minute rush for northbound traffic uh, heading north on Garden Street. Um, but 23-plus hours of the day, this intersection would actually operate better as an always stop. Bailey says after the stop signs are installed, the city will continue to monitor the intersection. And if traffic patterns increase, they'll have the option of putting the traffic signals back up. He's also confident that not only will traffic flow and wheelchair access improve, but all pedestrians will benefit. Uh, we're also planning to add a street light on the northeast corner just to improve illumination and improve pedestrian safety at nighttime. Um, so we do expect this is going to provide a much better level of service for pedestrians as well. They don't have to wait for red lights either. They can just cross as soon as they get to the intersection. If you have any questions about the project at Annapamu and Garden Streets, contact City Transportation. After 100 years, the city recently replaced an important bridge crossing Old Mission Creek on the west side. We're here to celebrate the opening of the Annapamu Street Bridge, and it is a beautiful thing. Uh, with good environmental consultants, great contractor support, committed staff, and a little bit of luck, we were able to complete the project without any significant issues. So great job to everyone. I'm especially touched to be here today. The West Side has been my home for so many years. And I used to walk my dog through here. Rest in peace, Roxy. We can remember her today and the families and the dogs and the children and everybody that calls the West Side home. But my favorite thing about Old Mission Creek is that Caltrans thought, oh, we're going to make the creek go on the other side of the freeway. And Mother Nature thought differently, right? So I'd like to thank her, too, for our beautiful day today. I'm looking forward to the future generations that are going to be able to uh, benefit from this bridge. And I thank you all, and, and I thank the neighbors for uh, being patient with the, with the construction. Retirement of old bridges is bittersweet. Walking over the old bridge before the project began, I would think about all those individuals in the past who built it and all those years of service it gave to the community. With modern design and quality control methods, this bridge should easily see its 200th birthday. It will be a few years before you and I meet again for that ribbon cutting ceremony. And on behalf of Assemblymember Monique Lamone, I would like to present this certificate to the city of Santa Barbara in appreciation of all of the tireless work and dedication that's gone into completing this bridge project. So I'm going to hand this over Thank to you. Thank you. Three, two, one. The new bridge was paid for with a grant from the Federal Highway Administration. Thinking about natural disasters can cause fear, and many times we avoid the issue of disaster preparedness altogether for the same reason. But what if there was a program that educated and prepared us for such emergencies? Mary Lou Cisneros has that story. Lupe, yeah. you got any victims in there? No. Yeah. 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 Santa Barbara has had its share of disasters over the years, from fires to floods to earthquakes, and we've learned that preparedness is the key to safety. The CERT, or Certified Emergency Response Team program, is available in Santa Barbara County to educate residents about disaster preparedness. I, I always tell people when I'm instructing the class that if you ever felt like you never belonged to anywhere, once you join the CERT community, you definitely belong here. So it's, it's just a unique bunch of individuals that take the class and also participate. 
CERT courses are instructed by trained CERT graduates and professionals with a background in emergency response. There's a term that we use called SUVs, Spontaneous Unaffiliated Volunteers. And those are basically people who say, I live in the community, but I'm not affected, so I've come over here to help the people who are affected. What can I do to help? It's a, a more efficient use of manpower if those people have some level of training, no matter how minor it is, and CERT goes a long way to that. CERT trained volunteers are the best volunteers that we can have in a large-scale incident. After traveling to Japan to study their emergency response methods and seeing the impact of civilian participation in rescue operations, the Los Angeles Fire Department created and implemented the CERT concept in 1985 to train civilians and give them the necessary tools to save their lives and those of their neighbors in case of a disaster. In 1993, CERT was expanded nationally by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. I've seen CERT all over the United States, and it's used differently in different parts of the country. While it was invented here in California, um, I've seen CERT used uh, in the Midwest, in, in tornado situations, in the Southeast, in flooding, where uh, a vast majority of the response is actually done by CERT members. The program is offered two to three times a year in Santa Barbara and requires a commitment of 24 hours, which are divided into eight three-hour classes. The program ends with an annual CERT drill in which the participants put into practice everything they've learned during the program. We alternate the locations of the drill, so um, every uh, registered program or jurisdiction participates, and so we'll alternate the cities you know, across the Santa Barbara County. We offer it to all CERT graduates, um, instructors included, everybody's invited to attend, and it's a mass casual incident that we simulate. Uh, they come in, they come in with their gear, their backpacks, and then they, they do the drill. Usually it takes place in the morning, and, and we just make it as, as realistic as we can. We have emergency responders, we have a lot of uh, different organizations participate, like Red Cross, Salvation Army, and everybody's there simulating a real disaster. The fact that the county tries to make this drill as realistic as possible also implies that despite being trained for this type of emergency, volunteers will see challenges in the drill they had not thought of before. It was really, really fun. Um, one thing that I learned was that I really need to work on my Spanish. <laughs> because they brought in some Spanish-speaking only victims, which was a great experience for me because I could communicate, but it showed me like, I should probably work on this a little bit more and strengthen those skills because how else am I gonna communicate? But it did allow me the opportunity to A, see that it's something I need to improve on, but B, it allowed me the opportunity to communicate in other ways and to figure out how to work with those victims. In response to the language barrier, coordinators started teaching some bilingual or joint classes where both English and Spanish participants will work together on the exercises and drills, but for the most part, these classes are taught separately to teach the concepts more effectively. Teach from uh, the very first unit, which is general preparedness, knowing your hazards, knowing what to do at home in order for you to be a responder in the community. And then we go on to fire extinguisher or fire safety, uh, fire suppression, then we go into uh, disaster medicine, uh, team organization, light search and rescue, uh, we talk about terrorism, we talk about psychological first aid, and so there's all these skill sets. Even though there's no obligation, CERT graduates are encouraged to stay involved after completing the program by training to become instructors and community volunteers. We've used uh, CERT volunteers in multiple uh, disasters. Uh, Refugio oil spill was one of them, but recently uh, with the Thomas fire and the debris flow, we had some of the CERT um, graduates be in the call center, uh, the county's call center. So they would go there and they would, uh, they would uh, take calls from the community and provide them with information. We had some, um, some CERTs also be involved in other capacities of like sandbagging and, and, and other you know, traffic control. So they do get utilized um, by other jurisdictions. 
There is also a teens program offered once a year during the summer. The program has been successful, leaving teens with the desire to do more, like Natalia Rios, who was part of the group of teens who started a search club at Dos Pueblos High School to educate their peers about what to do in case of a disaster. Being in school, we're not with our parents or, you know, we're te not technically, but like, we're on our own, so um, if we learn these things, we can help each other out. The CERT program is funded through the Disaster Preparedness Initiative, Aware and Prepare. It has a limit of 20 participants per course, and it is free. So there's too many people in the city um, to not be educated and to help each other um, because, you know, time is of the essence, and, and someone's life is at, is at risk if they're really injured in, in, a, in a disaster. <laughs> To learn when the next CERT course will be offered, visit their Facebook page. We'll be back with more Inside Santa Barbara right after this. Santa Barbara prides itself in having a healthy, family-friendly, and clean environment. Imagine if Santa Barbara's iconic public places that we all know and love were smoke-free. Thanks to the new outdoor smoking law, smoking of tobacco and electronic vaping devices are not allowed in public places. Keeping Santa Barbara a smoke-free city for all to enjoy. <laughs> Have you ever wondered about the construction taking place in your neighborhood? Are you curious of the role of our desalination plant in the city's water system? Would you like to be involved in shaping Santa Barbara but can't make it to a city council meeting? Then look no further than City TV or your local citywide informational hub where you can stay up to date about everything from road maintenance to building developments to upcoming events. Tune in to Cox Channel 18 or view us online at santabarbaraca.gov. Welcome back. Next, we visit a literal hidden gym in the Santa Barbara area. However, its natural beauty does not come without opportunities for improvement. Tune in as we see how the city is restoring this treasured neighborhood open space. Nestled between a popular trail and neighborhood park, Hidden Valley Park lives up to its name because it truly is a hidden jewel. As one of the last remaining undeveloped areas of the Arroyo Borough Creek watershed, this 2.8 acre site is home to beautiful scenery framed by elegant sycamore and eucalyptus trees, chirping birds, and Arroyo Burrow Creek. But the natural escape it provides is being threatened due to overgrowth of invasive plants. Creek's project planner Tim Burgess spearheads the City Creek Division's restoration process. In a lot of places these pipe and wire revetments, the, the stream has kind of undercut around them or uh, um, moved its way through them and, and they've become sort of obsolete and not really functional anymore. And in some cases they're actually causing more damage to the bank and more erosion. Wherever they weren't really functioning, we removed them. And so what we're going to put in place is uh, more um, biostabilization. So planting native trees right along the banks and, and, and installing coir logs and stabilizing that bank in other ways, that's gonna be more natural and more of a sustained bank stabilization. The restoration process consists of a three-part plan to restore, remove, and replace. Restore native plants to the site, remove non-native invasive plants as well as harmful pipe and wire revetments, and replace an old chain link fence. For this project, we are um, removing a lot of these non-native plants, and it's about 1,500 linear feet of creek. We will be, after we remove these non-native vines and things, we're gonna be planting 2,500 native plants, and that's about 450 large trees included with that. There's a really well-established, mature native ecosystem here, and this restoration project is a little different from what we typically do in that we're not really coming in and regrading. Uh, we're not taking out a lot of plants that are existing. Um, and that's the bulk of this project is pulling out a lot of the um, non-native Cape Ivy, English Ivy, Periwinkle, and, and where they're just really kind of climbing and taking over these willows along the bank and kind of giving these native plants a reset. We're also removing 522 feet of pipe and wire revetment, and there's actually 822 feet total, but 300 feet of it was deemed uh, still um, functioning as bank, 
bank stabilizing, especially down in this lower area. Uh, we're also, as part of this project, we're replacing this chain link fence in the park with a wooden fence and we're going to put it about 10 feet further, 10 to 12 feet further in and we're going to uh, plant the top of this bank with native trees and native vegetation. The goals of the project are to improve stream habitat and uh, stream function. The total cost for the restoration project is $297,000. The funding is provided wholly through Santa Barbara's Measure B, which was passed by city voters in 2000. Measure B placed an additional transient occupancy tax of 2% on hotel guests, and the proceeds provide direct funding for creek restoration and clean water programs. And that little extra expense is making a big difference in our local watersheds. It's important to restore that balance that you have in an ecosystem. And so with disruption of an ecosystem, sometimes you get, you get a lot of imbalance um, among species. And like these non-native vines, they've really started to invade the whole site. And so they really kind of, they take over um, and they lower the biodiversity in the area. It's important because we value biodiversity. However, the restoration team found that others also value the project's outcomes. Nearby residents shared their input with the Creeks Division early in the process to help shape the project. I think the restoration project is a very good idea. I think it's very good to restore it and, and more people will learn what, what we have as native in Santa Barbara. Although the Hidden Valley Restoration Project is a feat in itself, it is one part of a larger effort the City Creeks Division is undertaking to improve our waterways. Along with the Arroyoboro Estuary, the um, Lower Arroyoboro Open Space, um, Barger Canyon, the Golf Course Project, we are cumulatively, we are um, improving a lot of habitat. And so as these opportunities come up to restore this, um, we like to take that and improve, improve on them as much as possible so that you, know, you get a more of a watershed-wide benefit. To learn more about this and other Creeks restoration projects, visit santabarbaraca.gov slash creeks. Traveling down the Arroyoboro Creek about a mile towards the ocean, you'll find another restoration project at the Arroyoboro Open Space. Volunteers gathered at the Arroyo Burrow open space at the end of Allen Road on November 17th to install native plants in the newly restored area. We've been doing a creek restoration project out here over the last several months and today is the first day that we are getting our plants in. Right now we've got about 30 volunteers from the community out here planting native plants along the creek to bring back the native habitat out here. And you know, it's great to get the community involved so that they can see what's happening out here. They can take ownership for, for what's happening and um, feel a part of the future of the site. Um, you know, a lot of the plants we're planting today are right along the trail edge so people can come back and visit the plants that they've planted, see them grow over time and really feel connected to this open space park. Getting the community to be involved, they, they take some ownership of it. Um, understand more personally what's happening out here and they can see the change over time. You know, they're out here right at the beginning when these plants are going in the ground and they'll be able to see um, these plants grow and the site change over the next several years. I am here today not only to revegetate this very important riparian habitat, but also to help plant trees and bushes that will absorb carbon dioxide and work towards reducing climate change. In addition to benefiting the environment, these locally sourced plants will help to improve habitat diversity on Lower Arroyo Borough. And this planting day offers the Creeks Division an opportunity to communicate with the public. It's a huge educational opportunity, yeah. We, we get to talk to people about the plants that they're planting. Um, they get to learn about the different native, native plants we have out here. Uh, they also get to um, understand more directly the restoration work that we're doing out here as far as the other grading and erosion control work that's happened over the last several months. So they get to firsthand really see this as it's, as it's taking shape and um, watch it change over time. This is such an important part for Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara County, and it is wonderful to be able to help uh, protect it for current and future generations. The Arroyo Borough open space is open to the public every day from sunrise to a half hour past sunset. In 1956, President Eisenhower started the Sister Cities program to foster international relations and education. Santa Barbara has seven sister cities. Up next, we visit one of those sister cities, 
Patras, Greece. Santa Barbara's newest sister city is Greece's third largest city. With a population of 180,000 people, Patras is located right on the Ionian Sea and became one of Santa Barbara's seven sister cities in April of 2010. The Santa Barbara Patras Sister Cities Group aims to promote people-to-people -people relations through mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation. The Santa Barbara Patras Sister Cities Group, we have been working uh, very hard. We do have 15 members. Uh, we do a fundraising uh, every year. The last two years, we uh, did a fundraising for a hospital in Patras, Greece. It's a children's hospital. It's called the Caramandanio Children's Hospital. They were very much in need of supplies in medication and and equipment, of course, which they're very expensive. But our donation was a very small little item which goes into the child's underarm, underhand, so they can see the vein when they do IVs. Last uh, year, our fundraising at the Santa Barbara Winery at the Funk Zone, uh, we had a very, it was very successful. Uh, we are having another fundraising again in uh, next m March in 2019 and that would also be at the same place at the Santa Barbara Winery at the Function. We'll see where this funds that we uh, raised uh, will go at this time. It was a wonderful trip. Everybody really enjoyed it because you got to see real history, the history of uh, Patras, the, the ruins, one of the most beautiful countries I've seen. There's scenic drives in the, the ocean and the, uh, the bays, uh, the architecture, it's amazing. Santa Barbara has seven sister cities, and we're all have been members of several of those sister cities and have visited many of the sister cities. And it's really the best way to get to know the world is through a sister city visitation. In addition to Patras, Greece, Santa Barbara's other sister cities include Dingle, Ireland, Cator, Montenegro, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, San Juan, Philippines, Toba City, Japan, and Weihai, China initiated by President Eisenhower in 1957, which was world peace through people-to-people -people citizen diplomacy. And the citizen diplomacy is a lot of fun because once you become friends, you want to do things together. And one of that thing is having good time, fun, but then working on some projects as well. It's an amazing city, very similar in uh, geographic uh, elements in that it has the mountains and has the ocean. Here we have a very nice, pedestrian way in our main street. In Patras, you have many streets that are all pedestrian and wonderful paving and, and there's a lot of interaction of people and a lot of friendship between the people and a lot of sidewalk restaurants that we talk to each other and drink coffee and we begin to strike up a conversation with just anyone next to you and they're interested in knowing more about Santa Barbara when you talk to them and, that's, and they find out more about the city program. So we're kind of like ambassadors of goodwill when we go there and they, they talk to us. Patras has an amazing castle ruins up in the hill, kind of overseeing the bay. You walk up there and you can see the, the history of that castle. So I think that's, that was impressive to me, but the architecture was very great. Uh, open plazas and it spans very, very, very nice. But the difference is, is, of course, it's got much greater history and it's more, much more pedestrian friendly in the downtown than most California cities is. It's enjoyable to be able to walk through all those pedestrian streets and see the different uh, shops and talk to people, interact with people. So that's, that's a very pleasant experience. To learn more about Santa Barbara Sister Cities, visit santabarbaraca.gov slash sister cities. We all know that water is a precious resource, and after eight years of drought, conservation is more important than ever. Next, learn about an organization that is helping us all do our part. Since 2011, Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program has given out the Water Hero Award to individuals, businesses, and organizations that go above and beyond in their water conservation efforts. Sweetwater Collaborative was recently named Santa Barbara's Water Hero of 2018. Well, the mission of Sweetwater is basically to teach people to live well within our watershed and understand the regenerative processes that can benefit our community and individual lives and our environment. Letting people know that they don't have to sacrifice beauty for um, water savings. I think it's clear 
why the whole community benefits from proper kind of watershed stewardship. What's so important about what Sweetwater's doing is they're kind of paving the way and showing people how to do it, and especially with a lot of artistry added into it. Sweetwater Collaborative has been educating the community on creative solutions to rainwater collection and smart watering techniques. Since 2013, Sweetwater Collaborative has conducted 54 hands-on workshops, led 40 101 classes, and conducted four Sweetwaterwise walking tours for hundreds of participants. Participating in the workshops and the classes, I mean, it's all direct, hands-on kind of experience. Homeowners and professionals alike can all uh, show up to class and, and you know, fill in some of their knowledge gaps that they probably have. One of Sweetwater Collaborative's recent projects took place at the Impact Hub in the Funk Zone. So we're at the Impact Hub on Yananole Street in the Funk Zone. And the Impact Hub approached Sweetwater about a partnership, putting in a native garden uh, was what their original intention was. I saw that there was um, air conditioning condensate dripping. And so um, we decided to capture that water and put it in a barrel and try to redirect it out into the landscape. And we also put a native garden alongside of the parking lot, which needs to be watered very infrequently, but there is a tap in the wine barrel where the air conditioning condensate water is stored, which can also be used to water the native garden on occasion. Another Sweetwater Collaborative project is at the Lifescape Garden at Santa Barbara City College, where a rainwater harvesting tank was introduced to reduce the garden's potable water consumption. We're at uh, City College right now, and we are at in back of the facilities building, which is next to the Lifescape Garden. And um, this was an early project of Sweetwater's um, to put in this 2,000 gallon tank, um, which is fed by both sides of this facility's building roof. And a unique feature of this tank is that the inlet and the outlet are uh, in the same pipe, and that allows for more water storage in the tank, so that when the water comes in and fills up and starts to back up here, then as it backs up, it will overflow down here, and then it goes through this pipe, under those pavers, and into the overflow. We're here in the Lifescape Garden at Santa Barbara City College, and the rain tank that uh, was installed at a Sweetwater project, as a Sweetwater workshop, just was overflowing to the ground near the tank. And, um, I was teaching the lab for landscape construction here at City College and worked with the students to create an overflow from the rain tank into a rain infiltration garden. So what we did is um, to connect the overflow from the rain tank, bring it across this pathway and discharge the water that's overflowing from the full tank into this garden here. The object being to give the water as much opportunity to infiltrate into the soil as possible. So we created this um, flowing sort of earthwork here that will allow the water to flow in and infiltrate all the way along the, the course into the ground. So we get maximum infiltration of that rainwater. It's very important for water to infiltrate into the ground because this is what restores the groundwater and nourishes the trees and plants in the area. By storing that water in the ground, the plants can go into the dry season for many months. You should always uh, plan for an overflow and see it as a resource and as a way to capture more water and infiltrate it into the ground. Okay, so this is where the outlet from the overflow discharges into the garden. As water flows around, we hope that we can infiltrate as much of it as possible in the garden. And we've used uh, sandstone rocks to anchor and hold the soil here and then the water makes its way from here on down and through the system uh, but this this rocking here is essential to keep this area stable uh, when water's flowing out of the pipe. Sweetwater conducts uh, hands-on community workshops to bring people from the community together onto a particular project so that people can get hands-on 
experience doing the work of rainwater harvesting and uh, water-wise landscaping. It's really wonderful when people from the community come together and participate in a workshop and can learn hands-on how to do these type of techniques and then take that knowledge home and put that into practice. A great place to learn more about our workshops and class, class events is at sweetwatercollaborative.org. Um, and you can go there and join our mailing list and you'll get updates, um, seeing when those workshops are and uh, when the class dates are. For more information on how you can save water, visit santabarbaraca.gov slash water. Up next, we sniff around the city to dig up the significance of some of its most unique protectors. Stay tuned as we see how man's best friend can be a police officer's best partner. After six years of service, or 42 dog years, life can be, well, rough. One of Santa Barbara's police canines, Jake, transitioned from criminal chasing to ball chasing when he retired in January. While his partner and handler, Sergeant Chris Payne, will miss his fierce barks on the job, he reflects on the long walk he and Jake have taken together. Canine Jake has been through thousands of hours of training. Uh, we start off, well, they come as a started dog, so they have some initial training when we first receive them at the police department. Then we go through a six week uh, handler course together. And then after that, we train 10 hours a week every week. I would have to say it's just the comfort of having him in the car every day was, was phenomenal. Um, he could change people's attitude pretty quick and uh, brought a lot of safety to, to my job and to all the other officers and the uh, citizens in the community here. The bond is everything. Um, if, if he doesn't trust me um, fully, then, then he won't do his job to the best of his potential. So the bond is super important because we'll ask them to do things that a normal dog would never do and put them in situations that are very uncomfortable for them. But because of that bond, they, they trust me and they trust the hand, you know, each police dog is gonna trust their handler and they'll do those things that we ask them to do even if they don't want to. However, Jake is a valued partner beyond his cuddly presence. Through narcotic sniffs, area searches, and finding wanted criminals, Jake has proved that his bite is just as strong as his bark. Uh, last year, uh, in the beginning of uh, 2018, actually almost a year ago exactly, uh, the Sprint store on State Street was robbed by two armed robbers and they fled down into Carpinteria and actually K9 Jake was able to track them both down and capture them. It's actions like this that display the importance of a K9 program and why the police department values these four-legged officers. The importance of the K9 uh, is officer safety uh, and the fact that a K9 can do something uh, that an officer can't uh, and uh, that is smell their way through an investigation. Uh, a canine has 2.5 million olfactory sensors in their nose, uh, where humans only have about uh, 500,000, something like that. I think what we look for is mission specific. Uh, our dogs uh, uh, look for narcotics uh, and they are protective dogs, meaning uh, they protect their handler and they protect other police officers. I think the public would be really interested to know uh, that a large majority uh, of the canine program itself uh, is funded through private donations. Uh, so there are uh, many different benefactors uh, in the city uh, that give uh, to the Santa Barbara Police Foundation and the Santa Barbara Police Foundation uh, helps to fully fund the program. Uh, the canine program is not done through uh, our general fund dollars. It's completely private funds. Because of donations, Jake's legacy can live on. Upon his retirement, a generous donation of $50,000 was made to the Santa Barbara Police Foundation by local philanthropist Lee Luria, specifically reserved for the canine fund. This will enable a couple more of Santa Barbara's police officers to gain a new partner and family member. After working an average of seven to eight years, canines often transition into living with their handlers. In early February, Sergeant Payne made a ceremonial donation to the city to fully adopt Jake as his new family dog. He's going to have a life of leisure. Uh, hopefully he 
accepts it. Uh, most of these dogs are pretty active and uh, it takes them a little bit of time to figure out that they're not uh, not going to work anymore. So there's, there's definitely a transition phase. Uh, we've been partnered together for the last six years uh, and it's by far and away been the, the biggest highlight of my career. I wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything. Thank you, Jake, for your service. May your coming days be filled with treats and belly scratches. And that's going to do it for this edition of Inside Santa Barbara. If you have any questions or comments, please give us a call at City TV at 564-5311. And if you miss the show, not to worry. You can always catch us online at santabarbaraca.gov. I'm your host, Larry Good. Remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara.